This video is a little over two years in the making, but more on that later. I've been playing Minecraft on peaceful mode since 2016, but I don't usually keep track of how long I've been in a world. Back in the ancient time of February 2021, I saw many videos of people documenting the progress they made in 100 days of playing a Minecraft world. It's not like it's critical to be efficient to enjoy peaceful mode, but I was curious how much I personally could get done in 100 days. So on day one, I spawned in a beautiful old growth type with many dogs. I would have to acquire bones as soon as possible. Before selecting where I would set up, I had a look around. Collecting wood from a fallen tree because I didn't feel like collecting saplings just yet. And in case it wasn't clear before, the first 45 days were recorded in 1.16 on the Android version of Minecraft Bedrock. Again, more on that later. After grabbing some sugarcane, which I planned to use for maps, I stumbled upon a partially underground lake, which just so happened to have one singular wheat seed. I enjoy making crop farms, and for the time that they were still in the game before 1.18, I liked building my bases around modifying pre-existing underground lakes. I decided then and there that this would be my new home. So I planted down the sugar cane and set off in search of stone. Fortunately, there was a cave system nearby. Later, I found a closer entrance when I returned with my stone pickaxe and some torches. I managed to get about a half stack of iron when I carelessly allowed my stone pickaxe to break. And I was actually thinking of keeping my old tools in this world too. I barely knew you, stone pickaxe. Your life was short, but you helped me acquire so much iron and coal. You will be missed. With the loss of the stone pickaxe weighing heavily on my heart, I exited the cave to find the sun rising on day two. I smelted the iron and started chopping down the gravity-defying tree hanging over the pond. Since I don't like messy leaves, this meant chopping up all of the other trees connected to it as well, including another gravity-defying tree that was much larger. At least I'd get a lot of resources. When I reached the top, I took the opportunity to look around. Alas, the render distance on my phone didn't let me see that much. Using the newly acquired iron, I made myself some shears and an iron pickaxe. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any sheep to make a bed. Speaking of sheep, I should probably get started on a wheat farm. I soon realized why I couldn't find any sheep. Thanks for this wool, I guess. These wolves could be brutal. Glad I'm not a fox. Or a sheep. As is tradition when playing a new world, I temporarily got lost. Fortunately, the torch path between the cave and the base caught my eye and I was able to get back home. But I still didn't have enough wool for a bed, so I spent most of the night mining. It was raining when I exited the mine on day three. But I finally spotted some sheep. Bed acquired. Not wanting to disrupt the forest too much, I decided to hunt for more gravity-defying trees. On the way, I saw a blur of white and excitedly grabbed my shears. However, it turned out to be a baby sheep. As I chopped down trees, I couldn't help but worry a little about the baby sheep, but perhaps they would be okay on their own. On day four, I decided to venture east in search of anything interesting. I found a floating island, another fox being hunted by a wolf, and berries, another plant crop, albeit one that could hurt me. I also found a roofed forest. One of the dark oak trees had invasively grown on the spruce side of the river, so I did the ecologically responsible thing and removed it. I then did the not-so-ecologically responsible purging of salmon from the river. I wanted a dog, and for that I would need bones. But in spite of axing multiple salmon, I didn't get a single bone. To distract myself from my disappointment, I briefly investigated the roofed forest and retrieved a lilac. After gathering the remaining saplings from the invasive tree, I checked out the plains to the north of the roof forest and headed home. Day 5 started with more tree chopping, and I later began work on renovating the pond. I finally got enough sugarcane for a map, but I... I can't tell where I am. I've forgotten how to read maps. It is now night, and I still can't figure out where I am. On day 6, I briefly met a fox family before resuming the pond renovation. Once that was done, I ventured south across the river and found some cows to take home. Beef isn't all that useful in peaceful mode, but you still need leather if you want item frames and books. By the time I managed to contain the cows at home, a sheep had also joined us. And after gathering more cows and sheep on day 7, I added a proper gate system to the animal pen. On day 8, I fed the sheep and swapped out some podzole for regular dirt. I like using podzole in pig pens, but sheep need grass. 
I cleared another large tree from the surrounding area, and at this point I had gathered so much wood that I decided to make a designated wood barrel. The top of the hill behind the pond seemed like a good place for a house, so on day 9 I cleared the trees from that area. Construction began on day 10. Since I had stacks of spruce wood, a log cabin seemed the logical choice for a house. During construction, I noticed some wolves eyeing up the sheep, but walls are 1.5 blocks high, so I didn't worry about it. I continued working into the night. When I happened to look over at the animal pen, I saw that the sheep were missing. I rushed over to discover that they had been reduced to mutton and wool. I had forgotten that since wall blocks don't take up a whole block, it is possible to damage mobs inside them if they are too close to the edge. For a moment, I contemplated revenge, but retaliation would not bring my woolly friends back. I placed their remains in a wood barrel and resumed construction. Day 11 saw the installation of a stairwell up to the second floor. The second floor itself? Why must trapdoors always do this to me? and a side porch. On day 12, I added the doors and moved my furnace inside. I placed the hoppers and barrels to complete the smelter array, and finally the log cabin had its fireplace. At least it would once I gathered more stone to cover up the hoppers. On day 13, the front porch got some lanterns. I also made a stone cutter to make stairs more efficiently, gathered more stone for the house, and grabbed a few cave mushrooms because you'd never know when those will be useful. Having gathered more stone and iron, I used the partially constructed fireplace for the first time on day 14. Afterwards, I finished adding the stone portions of the fireplace, and added some stairs to the foundation. So, great news, I finally remembered how to read maps. Bad news, my house is on the edge of the map. Why does this always happen? It's so unfair! On day 15, I placed the cave mushrooms outside the house. This mushroom patch needed some variety, and began adding roofs to the porches. Somehow, it took me the entire night just to get the first layer of slabs in place. I returned to the cave on day 16 and finally made a clock to help with keeping track of the days when I was underground. Since this pre-1.18 cave was at the correct Y level for diamonds, I opted to explore instead of strip mine. However, a sudden burst of thunder caught me off guard. Again, this was recorded before 1.17, so lightning rods weren't an option to protect the mostly wooden house. But I needed to find diamonds. Fortunately, less than three minutes after starting my search, I found them. There were three, enough for a pickaxe. Not wanting to lose my diamonds, or my house to the continuing storm, I rushed to the surface. Relieved that my house was unscathed, I slept the storm away. On day 17, I crafted the first diamond pickaxe, and began construction on the chimney. It probably took longer than it should have, especially since it took until day 18 to finish. But with the chimney done, I could start adding a roof to the rest of the house. But day 19 began with me taking down the roof because I had done it incorrectly. I finally added the missing piece of wall above the fireplace, and I did eventually figure out the roof. The chimney blended into the new roof too much though, so I added some cobblestone walls to the back. Inside, I filled in the nook below the stairs. After that, it was back to the mine for more andesite for the roof. On day 20, I returned from the mine, feeling pretty satisfied with how the house looked so far. Using the freshly gathered stone, I continued building the roof and worked through the night. By day 21, I had ran out of stone for the roof yet again, and wanted to find more diamonds and iron. Mining for diamonds seemed the most efficient way to achieve both objectives, so it was back to the cave. Ultimately, I found one diamond and a bunch of iron and stone. I also grabbed ten obsidian while I was down there. I wasn't quite sure where I would put another portal just yet, but at least the materials were gathered. On day 22, I continued working on the roof, and finally it was finished. On day 23, I added a ceiling to the bedroom, as well as some lighting throughout the house. I was satisfied with the outside, except that it still needed windows. The inside could use some decorating, too. Coincidentally, a traveling salesperson stopped by the next day on day 24. They tried to sell me sand, which I wanted for windows, but alas, I had no money. They also had glowstone, but again, I had no money. I'd have to find a village and probably set up that nether portal for fast travel soon. Armed with a new locator map, I ventured south looking for my own sand and some more dark oak saplings. I found some dark oak trees, but I got distracted by a cave hidden behind one of them. When I emerged, it was night and I was in the middle of the dense forest. 
Thanks to my map, I made it back to the river and gathered more dark oak wood and saplings. I failed to get bones yet again, but I did get an ink sack. Since the map wouldn't take me very far, I decided to follow the river on day 25. On my journey, I spotted a four-block-tall sugarcane, a sugarcane inside of a spruce tree, and a dead end. Fortunately, it was easy to dig the canal to the next river, and I was back on the move in no time. Eventually, the river led to a swamp and a jungle. New biomes meant new stuff. I acquired some cocoa beans and some jungle wood for growing more cocoa beans when I got home. Unfortunately, there was only one sapling, so after replanting, I didn't have any to take home just yet. I gathered some bamboo, melon, and finally that night, I gained not one, not two, but three feathered friends. I even got two jungle saplings to take home after chopping down another tree. Gathering bones to get dogs may have been a bust, but I had three very colorful friends and a bunch of jungle-specific stuff to take back home when the sun rose on day 26. Maybe it was a good thing the house didn't have windows at this time. It certainly made getting the parrots inside easier. That being said, I wanted to eventually have white stained glass for the cabin. At the time, I had just learned that composting cookies was more efficient for bone meal than just composting wheat. So, using the freshly gathered jungle wood and cocoa beans, I set up the cocoa bean growing area. On a different note, I'm so glad they added cartography tables. I like making maps, not just for navigation, but also just to have one in the house to show the surrounding base area. Or in my case too, since the cabin and its surrounding area aren't neatly inside a single map. And since cartography tables make it much cheaper to create and expand maps, starting map walls can happen much faster. So I started the map directly north of the home map on day 27. But before filling that map, I spent day 28 beginning to fill in the expanded home map. While filling in the home map, I found a village on day 29. That meant acquiring some new crops to grow back home, gaining some emeralds, and just generally looking around for interesting stuff. It was a plains village at the base of a windswept savanna, so it was mostly normal. One of the chests just so happened to have a saddle, which would of course make exploring much easier and faster. So on day 30, I left the village to continue exploring until day 34. The keen-eyed among you will notice that the horse I'm using changes very rapidly. The truth is, I'm generally very utilitarian when it comes to video game animals. Kind of always have been. While I am very sentimental about Daisy, she is an outlier. And also, this section of the video was recorded long before Journey to the End. So, if I encountered a horse that did not have a satisfactory speed or jump, it was going to be replaced. For the longest time, I assumed those memes complaining about people who got leather from horses were extremely exaggerated. Like, I get that if you're farming for leather, cows are way more efficient since they don't require golden carrots, and obviously you don't mess with other people's pets. But if we're talking about random horses that just spawned in, which are contributing to the lag, especially back when I was playing on an Android phone, aren't they fair game? That being said, I understand if this revelation permanently alters your opinion of me as a person, especially since I will not be disclosing how much leather was in my inventory by the end of day 34 when I returned home. Now that I knew where a village was, it was time to start preparing for the nether by gathering more obsidian. Of course, I'd need a place to put the nether portal, and the yet unbuilt basement seemed like a good location. During day 35, I continued working on the basement. I decided to do a 3x3 portal, so I needed even more obsidian. After placing the last two obsidian blocks, lighting the portal, and getting some gold, I was ready for the nether. While it certainly is better than a three block wide island over a lava sea, spawn being in a closed cave still didn't feel that great. Fortunately, there was a cave that led down, and after a little digging, out into a more open area. Now that I'd found some piglins, it was time to begin bartering. Since I first learned it was in the game, I've always enjoyed fishing. But of course, you need string for that, so I was hoping to get string from bartering with the piglins. After 16 gold ingots, I did not get any string. So I had to resort to plan B. I don't want to talk about it. But you just got done saying you're utilitarian about video game animals! Ah, yes, thank you for bringing up that point, symbolic representative of the audience who will call me out on my nonsense. You see, striders look very sad and miserable at all times, which prompts me to feel sad for them. Whereas Minecraft horses constantly look a bit smug, like they're mentally rehearsing some backhanded compliment. Like, 
Oh, you're so brave to draw your own Minecraft skins. Also, there was a baby strider. Listen, I may be a monster, but I'm not completely heartless. I mean, I still got the string, so I am a little heartless. Anyway, it was convenient that it was raining when I returned to the overworld on day 36 so that I could start fishing. What was less convenient was that it stopped shortly after. Of course, there's always other things to work on, so after some farming, I made an automatic composting system. Unfortunately, somehow one of the parrots had followed me outside. I'd have to get them back inside the cabin at some other time. Now that I had bone meal, it was time to install some windows in the cabin. With the windows done, I began working on the basement through to day 37. But then I was getting a bit bored with working on the basement, so I made another map. But didn't you already make a map to the north ten days ago on day 27? Ah, whoops. There, problem solved. Later that night, I decided to take the wool from my deceased sheep and used it to make paintings to hang in the house. Might be slightly morbid, but I like the idea that a part of them will always be home. So sheep are more deserving of your emotional attachment than horses? Seeing as I had actual plans for those sheep to make a wool farm instead of them being a temporary means to an end, yeah, I then spent days 38 through 41 filling in the north map. On that trip, I got some wool from random sheep, some more wool and mutton from a totally not suspicious wolf, vines, a blue orchid, loot from a ruined portal, flowers from a flower forest, loot from a pillager outpost, loot from an ocean ruin, including a treasure map, the buried treasure from that map, though I had to leave some stuff behind because of inventory limitations. And after dropping off my treasures, installing some plumbing, starting a mini vine farm, and displaying the treasure map as a souvenir, I finally placed a copy of the northern map on the map wall. Four days of adventuring was enough procrastination that I felt ready to resume working on the basement once again. But once again, I needed more andesite, so I returned to the mine on day 42. I think the main lesson lesson I'm learning from all of this is I would be way more efficient at building in Minecraft if I would just gather all the supplies I needed before starting building. Once I was finished with placing the newly acquired andesite, I did some farming and started thinking about filling in the seven other maps. But I really wanted to go poking around in the nether again for day 43. I exchanged my two gold ingots for some gravel and ender pearls. But then I caught the end of a hunt that ended in tragedy for one of the piglins. Oddly, the other piglins seemed unaffected by their companion's demise. Was that a setup? Did I just witness a long-live-the-king type of moment? Regardless, I didn't have time to concern myself with the intricacies of piglin politics while I looked around the Crimson Forest as this was long before I had even thought of starting my Minecraft lore series. On day 44, I decided to return to the overworld. It was raining, so I started fishing. Again, this was before 1.17 was even announced. I didn't have copper. I wasn't going to risk it. With the storm gone and the cabin safe, I now focused on the floor of the basement. With the basement housing the nether portal, I thought it made sense to use nether-related blocks like blackstone and crying obsidian. And since storage is always useful, I filled in the edges with barrels. After adding in some shelves and a wall to separate the portal from the rest of the basement because sometimes stuff wanders through, I thought the basement looked acceptable. The cabin probably needed some more decorations, but I was fairly happy with how everything looked. Which I suppose is good because it stayed that way for about two years. Unfortunately, I overestimated my patience to record all of the gameplay necessary to get to 100 days. Roughly 30 hours is a lot. Every couple of Minecraft days, I'd have to stop to transfer the recording files from my phone to my laptop because space was limited. There were also the minor but still annoying interruptions when my Bluetooth controller would randomly disconnect from my phone. At this point, I had spent maybe a week or two working towards this 100 days video while juggling my other day-to-day -day responsibilities, but I still didn't have any to show for it on my channel. So I thought, okay, how about I put this on hold for a bit while I do something smaller? And that's how the Hardcore But No Mobs Spawn series started. Because Hardcore was also a pretty popular topic at the time, but I had zero interest in dealing with monsters. I set out to reach the goal of getting a full set of netherite gear in addition to trying not to die, and proceeded to make 12 videos in that series. But in classic Amaranth and Mask fashion, I put that project on hold when I learned there was a 32-bit seed with a completely filled-in end portal, so that I could do the Journey to the End series. And that series was successfully completed over a year ago in July 2022. 
But between making videos about Minecraft seeds, lore, speculating about future Minecraft content, attempting to stream, and even entertaining the idea of not being an exclusively Minecraft channel, I didn't return to Hardcore But No Mob Spawn or to 100 Days in Peaceful. When I got my new laptop, I moved those worlds over so that they'd be safe. Sure, I felt a tiny bit guilty just leaving them unopened and unplayed. Their entries sitting there every time I opened up Minecraft to play with my friends or just unwind on one of my personal survival worlds. But I was so busy with other things, and realistically, my survival mode videos never got as many views as the seed videos. All the YouTube education channels emphasize the importance of focusing on what's appealing to the audience. So it wasn't anything personal against those videos, it was just that I needed to focus on doing what would work for the channel. Except it was personal for me. Sure, maybe not that many people watched watched my Let's Play style videos, and most likely even fewer people cared if I would finish. But when I made the twelfth episode of Hardcore But No Mob Spawn, past me assumed future me would eventually come back so that my work and effort had not been in vain. And when I referenced working on the 100 Days video in one of my other videos, past me was also assuming future me would finish the job. Maybe I wasn't disappointing any of my viewers that much, but was I letting past me down. All the same videos take time and effort. And after being laid off from my job at the start of 2023 and trying to juggle that mess, I didn't really have the energy to dive headfirst into finishing both projects. But then Mojang announced the addition of smithing templates, including the netherite upgrade template which was going to make getting a complete set of netherite gear that much more difficult. It had been about two years, but I still remembered from the first 96 days I'd spent playing in the hardcore but no mob spawn world that I was already having a difficult time getting netherite gear without also needing to find a smithing template, not to mention acquiring the necessary diamonds for duplicating the template. If I was going to return, it was now or never. But the return didn't go quite the way I had hoped. I felt almost angry that I didn't make it to 100 days. Like, somehow I think if I had died in lava on day 101 without getting a full netherite set, that would have been okay. But when I had a couple of minutes to think about what had just happened, that I died on day 99 without getting full netherite, I realized that maybe I didn't have a second chance in hardcore, but I did have a second chance for this goal of getting full netherite in 100 days before 1.20 released. After all, with having only played 45 days in the 100 days world, I still had more than 50 days to complete the objective, and so I updated the 100 days world I hadn't played since 1.16. Naturally, I needed some time on day 46 to refamiliarize myself with everything as well as gather some supplies before I made my way to the Plains Village. In some ways, it was good that I had taken a two-year break. When I first started playing Minecraft, I wrote off trying to learn Redstone because of the differences between Java and Bedrock. However, I had since learned just how useful automatic wool farms are, especially for netherite mining. On day 47, I entered the village, but before I could figure out where to put the wool farm, I needed to figure out where I could grow some giant spruce trees. Not only are they the most efficient way to to get a bunch of wood for beds, but they're also nice for getting sticks to get tons of emeralds from Fletcher's. I didn't think I'd have enough time to mine diamonds for a full set of gear, but I was confident I could trade for it in time. However, villagers have this annoying habit of walking into the saplings right before they grow up. I really didn't want to lose any librarians, armorers, or toolsmiths to that, so where could I put the saplings that they would be close enough to grow, but far enough that villagers wouldn't get suffocated? Ultimately, I decided on this island that was separated from everything by a river. The village had generated an oak bridge to the island, but since there weren't any buildings there, I didn't see villagers venture this way. With the saplings planted, it was time to start trading. I forgot that this village is partially in a desert, so some of the villagers are desert villagers. Neat. I'd need a sugarcane farm for the multiple librarians I had planned. In retrospect, I should have done an automatic farm, but oh well. And so began the grueling interviewing process for a mending librarian. Unfortunately, the business day ended before I could find a suitable candidate. While normally I'd just sleep the night away to continue interviewing, there was a strict 100-day deadline. So I lit up the spruce and sunflower island and searched the village for bread and other useful things. I then realized that since villagers didn't typically come to Spruce and Sunflower Island, that would make it a good location for another portal as well. I would just need to return home on another night to set up the corresponding portal in the nether. 
Day 48 began with trading and tree chopping. Listen, I know it looks bad to keep them in holes in the ground, but I can't afford to lose villagers with this deadline looming over my head. Interviewing resumed with a different villager. I guess the desert villager lost interest in the job, though I can't say that I blame them after so many rounds of interviews. Another day passed by with the position unfilled, but I did make good use of the night by chopping down trees for sticks. Day 49 was composed of more trading and more interviewing, but before the end of the day we finally got mending for 14 emeralds. Not bad at all. I certainly felt much more at ease being able to put mending on my very heavily damaged pickaxe. Again, I would need sticks in the morning to sell to the Fletcher. I started interviewing for the next librarian position on day 50, and we managed to get Fortune 3 for 14 emeralds in practically no time at all. Listen, this is temporary. I'm not the kind of monster who would keep librarians trapped forever, unless I forgot to let them out. At the end of the workday, I visited the ruined portal I found on day 30 to reclaim some obsidian before returning home. Once I entered the cabin's nether portal, I carefully dug my way to the appropriate coordinates, which unfortunately were over the lava sea, one of the many instances in which I am glad bridging works the way that it does on bedrock. Some nether portal and platform building later, and now there was a much faster route between the village and the cabin. Day 51, I returned to the cabin to pick up some supplies, but it started raining. Later in the challenge, I realized that maybe fishing wasn't the best use of my time, but old habits die hard and I do still like the opportunity to stop and think about what I'm doing while still being productive. But then it started thundering, and I didn't feel like trying to mine for copper. On day 52, I made my way back through the nether and to the village for yet more trading. I was finally ready to start figuring out where to put the wool farm, but this house would have to go. With that building out of the way, I tried to figure out the spacing with torches, and that's when I realized I actually wanted to put the wool farm on the other side of the dirt path. I mean, it probably wasn't a waste that I took down that first house because I'd eventually want to remodel the whole village anyway, right? Day 53 was spent mostly on constructing the wool farm and gathering more supplies. Day 54 was more trading and more working on the wool farm, including trading with the cleric for redstone. I can't emphasize enough how nice it was to not need to go mining for redstone. Again, future me will probably completely remodel this village, so it's fine that I'm reusing this one cobblestone to finish making the necessary observers, right? The farm was on its way to completion, so it seemed like a good time to start getting some sheep. You can't exactly have a wool farm with no sheep. Listen, I was about to say that I did more wood gathering that night and it's occurred to me that I've already said that a bunch. I've seen my retention graphs. I know that maybe three people have made it this far into the video, one of them being future me making sure that the captions I uploaded actually worked. I don't want to waste your time, so from here on out, if you think there are any major gaps in the passage of time that aren't explained, you can safely assume that I either spent the time chopping down trees, trading sticks for emeralds, or standing around trying to remember what I was doing. On day 55, I still needed dispensers for the wool farm when I realized there was this massive cobblestone on the edge of the village. Surely no one was using it. Okay, so maybe the cleric was using it, but again, surely future me will build something even better. I mean, a stone building? It was probably all kinds of drafty and damp inside. I'm doing the cleric a favor by taking it down. It was also very useful that I could buy bows for the dispensers from the Fletchers. That night, I made a quick trip to the cabin for some supplies, including a stone cutter. On day 56, it was back to librarian interviewing, but it started raining, so after emptying my inventory, I started fishing yet again. I had just noticed I got a Protection 4 book, which would be nice once I got some armor, when I saw a horse had spawned in. It seemed like it was trying to throw me off and into the pond for a bit, but eventually things worked out. After purchasing glowstone from the wandering trader I had noticed around the same time as the horse, and checking that the horse had a decent jump, I took it to one of the nearby pens. Afterwards, I resumed fishing until the rain stopped later that night. Since I was trying to get more sheep for the farm and I eventually wanted mud bricks for the building that would go around the wool farm, I started working on setting up a crop farm. That required some light terraforming, which continued into day 57. Once the villagers were up, interviewing resumed, but no success that day. But that is the last of the dispensers for the farm. During the night, I used the nether to return to the cabin for cocoa beans. 
White stained glass is usually the color I default to, so I wanted to try using a different color of stained glass. And brown glass happened to look good with the other blocks I planned on using. Figured I should try to get my money's worth from all these stone hoes I bought from trying to upgrade the toolsmith. Day 58 was the day of interruptions. It began with librarian interviewing, but when I took a break to trade some sticks for emeralds, it started raining, causing the villagers to run away. By this time, I had realized that fishing was not the most productive use of my time, at least while the wool farm was unfinished. But then I got interrupted by thunder. So that was that for day 58. I finally realized on day 59 that harvesting sugarcane would be less annoying if I used slabs to avoid falling into the water pockets. And surprisingly, the new librarian offered Efficiency 5 for only 27 emeralds. All my fortune pickaxe would be missing was Unbreaking, and then I was offered Unbreaking 2 for 15 emeralds. I was getting a bit tired of interviewing at this point. So I decided to accept rather than risk spending another how many days until Unbreaking 3 showed up below 30 emeralds. Now the fortune pick was good to go. On day 60, I started working on the foundation for the wool farm building, continued upgrading the toolsmith, and continued extending the crop farm. By day 61, I was working on the walls of the wool farm building and put the first sheep in their new permanent home. On day 62, the second sheep was placed, and thanks to the first sheep, there was enough wool to begin netherite mining. So that night, I returned to the nether, and next to the cabin portal, began a staircase down to Ancient Debris level. On the way down, I encountered Ancient Debris around Y level 54. This is not the first time this has happened to me, and it's not the first time I've double-checked that I didn't somehow enable cheats. As far as I know, I don't play Minecraft in my sleep, but my family does have a history of sleepwalking. The the chances that your sleeping self has placed conspicuous ancient debris in your survival world is low, but never zero. But hey, ancient debris is ancient debris, so I was glad to be two pieces closer to the goal. And so I started day 63 with netherite mining, found a third piece relatively quickly. I then found a fourth piece of ancient debris. Since it was only one again, I figured I should dig around and see if there were more. You would think I'd have learned my lesson from the way the previous series ended. And so I didn't find any more ancient debris before I had to return to the overworld. But with the gold I got from the nether, I could resume work on the wool farm. Of course, I forgot that the redstone torch needs to be on the same level as the rail. I don't know why I thought there needed to be a channel in the floor. To smelt the ancient debris, I needed more cobblestone for a furnace, so I borrowed some more blocks from the village. With that, I finally had my first netherite pickaxe. Sure, it took more than half of the allotted playtime to get this far, but now that the infrastructure of the netherite mine and the wool farm were mostly in place, things would go a lot faster from here. And on the dawn of day 64, I learned that unpowered powered rails will just stop a moving minecart. I can't be the only one who thought that they would just behave like normal minecart rails, right? The rails in the farm were no longer symmetrical, but at least it was working. I took a moment to admire the rising sun. The end of this day would mark the completion of an entire stack of days in this world. And then it started raining, which meant I had to frantically chase the villagers to trade. One more sheep in the wool farm, two more sheep in the wool farm, but then I was out of glass. Don't ask me how I got the string, but I got a shepherd. Sure, I'll need wool for beds, but I'll need emeralds and XP more. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell where the shepherd was. On day 66, I gathered some oak wood. Day 66? What about day 65? Hey, editing mask here. Looks like I accidentally skipped day 65 when originally writing this script. Probably has something to do with the fact that I somehow mixed up days 65 and 69 when renaming the video files. Fortunately, nothing major happened. The shepherd finally appeared, so I bought some shears to stock up the farm. I also worked some more on the wool farm walls, which meant I had to reclaim more logs from the village. Anyway, now that that's fixed... On day 66, I gathered some oak wood. I'd be using it for the wool farm building and figured I could just grab it from the village. I'd end up replacing everything eventually anyway. Another sheep in the farm. Should I feel bad about removing this roof when it's raining at night? Well, it stopped raining, so I guess I don't. Later, I made a quick run back home to grab some granite. Somehow I thought I had more than 12. Regardless, it'll make the foundation of the wool farm look a bit better than only bricks. On day 67, work continued on the outside of the wool farm. 
I added a baby sheep in the wool farm. It'll grow up soon enough anyway. Due to some misclicks, I accidentally released two sheep at once instead of just one, but they both went into their own spots easily enough. Added a second baby sheep to the farm. The advantage of putting baby sheep in the farm is they're much easier to drop into their individual spots. Sure, you lose out on some wool when they eat the grass before maturing, but you can always age them up. I didn't, but it's an option. And this time I had to deal with three sheep, two babies and one adult. Despite some nerve-wracking near misses, they each went into their own cells. Two more to go, one more to go, and no more to go. The wool farm was completely stocked. All that remained was the outside, starting with the walls. But of course I miscounted when adding the side room. It was an easy enough fix at least. Technically, it would have been more efficient to use slabs instead of whole blocks here, but then that sometimes does weird things to the lighting which makes the blocks look weird, and I just didn't feel like dealing with that. So far so good. Since there are no more sheep, this fencing can be reclaimed for other purposes. Adding them inside. Trust me, it'll make sense later. Also adding trapdoors instead of glass for windows because I don't think anyone wants or needs to see the minecart go around and around and around and around and around and around. On day 68, I placed the last of the trapdoors. I then purchased more bricks to finish the floor. Now I don't need to be so nervous about the zoning officer showing up unannounced. And with these last few lanterns, this space is done, even if it is a bit empty and lacks a roof. This villager looks so sad. They're a farmer. They were born to harvest and plant crops, but they just can't get to their precious wheat. There's just absolutely no way they could ever get to the wheat with this completely impenetrable fence in the way. It's impossible! Okay, either they've heard me or they've decided to leave so they can follow their dream of becoming a famous interpretive dancer. Whoops, forgot to take down these floating panes from the villager house that used to be here. I should also get rid of these panes. Like I said, I'll build something better. I know I keep saying that and it doesn't seem likely given how many days are left and I still haven't finished getting netherite. In fact, I'll go netherite mining right now! One, two, three pieces of ancient debris. Unfortunately, there weren't quite enough for a second ingot before I had to return to the overworld on day 69. I also failed to move the shepherd into the wool farm. At least the crop farm was productive. As a result, there were a whole bunch of seeds, but the composter array was back home at the cabin. Yeah, I definitely got a lot of use out of this nether path. Fortunately, this means more bone meal. While at the cabin, figured I'd use the home smelter to get the smooth stone for another stone cutter. Day 70 started with repurposing more cobblestone from the village, Later, I bought some dripstone from a wandering trader, moved the shepherd into the wool farm, made a blast furnace for faster smelting, lit up the farm using some lanterns, and added some more gates to make getting in and out of the farm a bit easier. The crop farm needed more fences though, so I grabbed some from the village. While checking the village for the last of the pre-made fence posts, I relocated some of the beds to make trading and managing the villagers a bit easier. Also crafted some more beds since I would need more villagers to trade with to get the gear I needed. Good, it's already working. Great start to day 71. We're at the point where you can add crop farming to the list of things that you can assume I'm doing if there's a noticeable, seemingly unexplained jump in time. That night I was on my way to the cabin, when I was surprised to find a pig on the other side of the nether portal. Guess he must have wandered through the portal from the Sunflower Island. I was a little worried about him walking off the edge of the platform with the lava sea below, but I figured the best I could do right now was give him a snack until I came back. Once at the cabin, I grabbed some stone from the cabin furnace array. I also converted the iron ore I had gotten before 1.17 into raw iron with the Fortune 3 pickaxe. 21 from 8 blocks, that's pretty good. With that, I headed back for the village. Fortunately, the pig had not wandered off into the lava sea and went into the portal himself. With both of us safely in the overworld, I guided the pig a safe distance away from the portal. The cow pen seemed like a good spot. Using some of the stone, I made two grindstones to eventually buy a diamond sword. By day 72, the diamond axe collection from trying to unlock the pickaxe trade was getting a bit out of hand. In other trading news, I was excited when I saw a second book could be unlocked on the one librarian. I needed more lanterns anyway. And of course it's Curse of Binding. Finally remembered the dripstone I bought on day 70, so I grabbed some water and started working on adding an area to farm dripstone. The basement of the wool farm seemed like a good location. Upstairs, I added a ladder so that building the second floor would be a bit easier. On day 73, I finally thought that maybe 
just maybe, having my map in the offhand when I was only working in one area really wasn't the best use of screen space. I finally purchased a chest plate from the armorer, which would be useful until I could get some diamond armor since I had more netherite mining to do. I don't understand why this toolsmith had trouble navigating to where all the other villages were. Villagers. Once again, it started raining, so I started fishing, looking at the partially completed wool farm. I mean, the important part with the sheep and the redstone was done, it was just the outside that wasn't finished. But seeing it unfinished wasn't a great view, so I switched to looking at the village. That also didn't look great from all the missing blocks I had repurposed elsewhere. So I went back to looking at the wool farm. The rain ended shortly before the start of day 74 anyway. I was about to resume working when I saw a cat. I had a bunch of fish and figured I should try to get a friend. After some trying, I got one orange cat and after some more trying, a tabby kitten. I sat them down next to the furnace area so they'd be safe. Afterwards, I ran back to the cabin again to get andesite to trade with the stonemason. I also grabbed an ink sack and feather because I thought using a book and quill would be a great way to keep track of what I needed to accomplish in the remaining 26 days. It's a shame I didn't use it because I was worried about wasting in-game time, so I just used notes in the real world instead. Day 75. I was back in the village continuing the basement below the wool farm. Of course, I need more vertical space for farming dripstone, so down we went. Child, no, this is not an appropriate place for you to play. This is an active construction site. I placed the dripstone blocks and replaced the entry block with a crafting table. The top kind of looks like a mat to wipe your shoes on before you come in, and sometimes you need a crafting table but don't want to lose space just to place one in the room. Reason I remembered that was because I needed to make some trapdoors to contain the water above the dripstone blocks. Why did I need dripstone? Well, it's a nice building block. Also, I just like the idea that I have a farm running passively in the background when I'm doing other things. Unfortunately, I forgot that you need to have at least one piece of pointed dripstone on the bottom of the block for more to generate. Later, I saw two more pigs on Sunflower Island. Were they looking for the one I'd encountered earlier? Couldn't spend too much time thinking about it because I needed to go to the nether to return to the netherite mine. And in this incredibly dangerous, hostile environment, I found a piglin Child. Child, where are your parents? Piglins do have parents, right? Given all the fire and lava in the netherite mine, I was a bit worried about leaving the piglin child unattended, so I made a plan. Get away from the lava. Come on, take the gold nugget. Good. Okay, good. We'll just safely make our way back to the mine hub. But I needed more gold, which was dangerously next to lava. No, do not go into the lava, child. Please just cooperate with me. We're almost there. Almost there. Need to make a boat. Child, child, where are you going? Okay, I guess we can go up the stairs. That will at least be far away from the netherite mine. Okay, never mind. Guess we won't go up the stairs. It's just as well with the nether portal at the top of the stairs anyway. And now the child is safely contained. I do not need to worry about them being harmed as I continue to netherite mine. But where are your parents? So that was an eventful way to start day 76, I guess. Uh, so y'all have a child with you. Would you perchance be missing a second one? I guess not. When I returned to the overworld, the pigs on Sunflower Island were still there. I think if they were looking for the first pig, they should have been able to find him by now. Tool update, after some trading, book purchasing, and anvil combining, I had a fully enchanted diamond shovel, which I named the Flint Finder because it would help me find flint for trading. It's not like gravel has any other uses. After a quick run to the wool farm and trading a bunch with the shepherd, it was off to the nether with the remaining wool. Ah, more piglins. Say, do you know if anyone is missing a child? Ow. Do any of you? That piglin just walked through the portal. You know what? That's a future problem. Time for mining. Flint finding time. Right. Wall lava is a thing. Wall lava is absolutely a thing in the nether. I will now be very careful keeping my distance and making sure I'm standing one block above the lowest point in the area until I inevitably forget to do so. That does not look like it should be that way, but I guess that works out for me. Time to give the child some more gold to keep them entertained. And then I continued mining into day 77. Hey, are you or someone you know missing a child? No? You sure? Okay. 
All right, there's a lot more of you here. Are any of you missing a child? Or know someone who is missing a child? Is that a yes? I should really let y'all out of the boat then so y'all can go home. All right, great, family reunion. Now it's not my problem anymore. I really need to install stairs. This is getting old. To that end, time to make nether bricks. Thanks to the flint, I unlocked the master trade on the first toolsmith on day 78. And it's just efficiency one. Of course. The second toolsmith had fortune one. I guess that's marginally better? Trouble is, I already have a fortune pickaxe. How? did this iron golem get into the farm? I mean, I guess it'll keep the crops safe. Would you invade a farm that had a nine foot tall guard? After feeding the pigs some beetroot, I finally realized I should make a chest to store seeds for when I return to the cabin. After leveling up the armorer so I can get diamond gear, I also threw this iron gear in the seed box to put in the cabin smelter for iron nuggets. Unbreaking one pants. For some reason, this feels a lot better than the two pickaxes. How did you trap yourself in the farm? Go! Be free! I said go! Be free! After disenchanting a bunch of axes for those sweet, sweet levels, I took them through the nether to the cabin for smelting into nuggets. Nothing wasted. Uh, I don't think you're supposed to be here. Well, not my problem. After filling up the smelter, picking up the nether bricks, and dropping off the seeds, it was time to return to the nether. And that piglin is gone, I will assume that nothing bad happened and they found their way back home to the nether safely. Down to the netherite mine. And the child is still here. Where is the adult? Did they seriously abandon their child in the netherite mine a second time? Might as well pick up this lava, fuel for the furnace, and make this area just slightly less dangerous. I don't think it's a great idea for you to go up the stairs lest you accidentally go into the portal, so it's back to the boat until your parent returns. Time to add some stairs and go back to the cabin to put the lava in the smelter. On day 79, I return to the nether for more lava and more quartz for XP in trading. Just gonna move the kid away from the wall so that the boat doesn't accidentally get nudged into the wall and they suffocate. Back to the village to put lava in the furnace for more nether bricks. Time for more fishing in the rain, but the rain ended that night. Again, how did you get trapped in the farm? Go on, go! Just go! Every single time! I did make a post on the community tab asking for name suggestions for the pig, so as of day 80, his name is Beetroot Berry. One of the other names suggested was Phil, so I gave that to the ginger cat. As for the brown tabby, I named her Tabitha because I am the most creative and original person I know. Finally had the thought to move the Fletchers to the wolf farm because chasing after them every time I wanted to sell sticks was getting old, and I didn't have another structure in mind to build for them, and we were down to the last 20 days in this challenge, and I didn't even have all of the diamond gear I would need yet. One down, two down... Do these two just not know how to walk through doorways? The doors aren't even there for them to get stuck on! And it's already night so they won't be getting inside today. Time to start putting in the upper level. I'm just never going to learn to not walk off, am I? Day 81, I finally got the last two Fletchers inside, so now getting emeralds will be a bit more efficient. Finished installing the ceiling in the wolf farm afterwards. That night, I ran back to the cabin to put seeds in the composter array, put the iron armor from trading into the smelting array, and then it was time for some netherite mining into day 82. Gave the kids some more gold before placing the nether brick stairs I brought and returning to the overworld. After upgrading the axe, as well as the shovel, we were two steps closer to the goal. On day 83, after some combining, I finally had unbreaking three pants. I needed more books to continue upgrading my gear though, so it was time to use some of that wheat. And then I spotted a nitwit, which contributes to the number of villagers in the village, so I wanted to move them elsewhere. One theory I've seen is that wandering traders are former nitwits. This would explain some things, like why nitwits seem to have a different sleeping schedule compared to other villagers. Seeing as the wandering trader occasionally offers items from the nether, like glowstone, I thought I would help this nitwit achieve their dreams by taking them to the nether. Unsurprisingly, they were immediately intrigued by the glowstone, which had me a bit nervous since we were right above the lava sea. Fortunately, they got back in the boat without too much more convincing. The basalt deltas didn't 
didn't seem like the safest location for this villager to learn more about the nether, so I worked on getting them to the cabin portal. Fortunately, no lava jumped out of the wall as I widened the tunnel for the boat to get through. Figured I should cover this open pit as well, and put in the last stairs down to the netherite mine. While I was there, I figured I would do some mining and check on the piglin child, and then I saw one of the adults again. Was this the child's parent? Evidently not. Day 84 started with more mining. After ascending the stairway back to the portal, it appeared the nitwit had made some new friends. Since they were no longer in immediate danger, I figured it would be best to free them from the boat so they could socialize a bit more freely, and gave them some bread before returning to the village. Netherek was accumulating rapidly from all the mining, so I made some more furnaces to smelt it faster. Yes, I could have just burned it, but I hate wasting material. On day 85, I finally added a trapdoor to the top of the ladder in the wool farm, made a bottle to get mud, figured I would use the dirt under under this house since it was floating in the river anyway, and turned that mud into packed mud. But before I could use it, I got distracted with putting protection for on my chest plate to make netherite mining a little less nerve-wracking. But I needed more XP, so after a whole bunch of unrelated stuff that went into day 86, including buying a mangrove propagule from a wandering trader to see if it would grow in time, I finally had enough levels for the chest plate. After upgrading to netherite, that was one piece of armor down. Later, I made a bunch of ladders and went to the wool farm's basement, because I was beginning to wonder if waiting for trades with villagers was really the best way to get the diamond gear to upgrade to netherite instead of just mining. There were a couple gravel patches on the way down. When day 87 rolled around, I encountered an aquifer. Unfortunately, it didn't have anything interesting, so after blocking off the water, I continued down. After some mining for diamonds, I happened upon an iron vein. Lava almost ruined my day, but at least the lava lake made it a bit easier to see when collecting more of the iron ore. I even found an iron ore block. Day 88, I returned to the surface after getting quite a bit of iron, but mining was a lot of work, so I didn't think I'd be doing that again. No, do not go down there, I can't lose my only non-mining source of redstone. Finally got a pair of diamond boots and made another anvil because the first one was getting damaged from all the combining I was doing. I then moved Phil away from the anvil, just in case. Finally purchased a diamond sword. It still needed looting before it replaced the iron sword, though. After removing some of the excess fencing from the cow pen, the crop farm was completely surrounded with fencing. Afterwards, I added the last stairs for the basement, continued excavating, placed a gate in front of the door so that no villagers accidentally wandered down to the mine, and placed some chests to store the deep slate and tuff that had accumulated. On day 89, I was about to head back to the village from tree chopping when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. A pig, a nitwit, and a sheep were all stuck in a pool of water. Unfortunately, I couldn't think of a punchline before the nitwit found their way back to the village. Ooh, gunpowder. Hey, would you happen to want to go to the nether with your friend? Think about it. Later, I started the roof of the wool farm, took a break to get Depth Strider 3 on my boots when I ran out of mud bricks, and then got more mud blocks for more mud bricks to continue the roof. It's a major help that mud bricks can be processed with the stone cutter considering all the stairs I needed. And of course, after doing a relog on day 90, it started raining. And of course, there's a storm. And it's not like I found copper during my little mining stint. A lot of stuff in this area was extremely flammable. I wasn't keen on losing a whole day to nothing, especially with day 100 looming on the horizon, but what was I gonna do? On day 91, I finally realized that keeping the librarians underground was maybe slightly less than humane. Finally, I got a diamond helmet, so I had one of each armor piece in diamond at least. After some more roofing, it was time for the nether again. There is another piglin child. Not my responsibility. Hey, villager, you aware of that kid down the hallway? Cool. It's mining time. On day 92, I took a break to drop off the netherrack, give the child more gold, drop off the lava and flint, and resumed mining. Got temporarily submerged in lava at one point. 
Fortunately, I was in full armor, but it was still a bit frightening. I had gathered a bunch of lava and flint, but only three pieces of ancient debris when I was ready to return. However, when I got to the top of the stairwell, the nitwit was missing. Did they wander off with one of the piglin groups? Anyway, once I was back in the village, it was time to smelt the ancient debris and at least some of the netherrack. Craft a netherite ingot and add it to my boots. Just two pieces of armor to go. Day 93, I compacted some of the nether bricks into blocks because there were just way too many. Ah, hello again. So did you decide you want to go to the nether? I really need to harvest that sugar cane. Later, I got seeds to take to the cabin. So this is where the first nitwit went. Realistically, I'm not going to be coming back much between now and the end of this challenge. So if you'd be willing to look after the parrots and cows and horse, that would actually be pretty helpful. So, uh, I guess make yourself at home in the cabin. I was about to return to the village when I remembered there was a fire charge, which could be used with that gunpowder from earlier. Think I'll need some of these cornflowers, too. Day 94, I still hadn't remodeled the village, but I also still needed to upgrade two armor pieces. So it was back to the nether. to mine into day 95. I grabbed more gold for making netherite ingots and gave the spare nugget to the child before returning to the village to smelt the ancient debris and a bunch of netherrack. After upgrading the helmet and pants, I finally had full netherite armor. And after upgrading the sword to netherite, I just needed one more ingot to have one of each netherite tool. Mining the river was getting old, so I made a wall of dirt in front of the tiny pond next to the wool farm to get more mud for more mud bricks. On day 96, I made brick walls to continue the second floor and later continued the roof. But I ran out of mud blocks again, so I needed to rebuild the dirt to mud wall. Once I had more mud bricks, I moved a stone cutter to the second floor so that making slabs was a bit less tedious. But I ran out of mud bricks again, so I needed even more mud. On day 97, after crafting more mud bricks and placing the slabs, the roof was finally done, which meant the outside of the wool farm was complete. It's simple, but it does the job of concealing the wool farm. Except the rest of the village still looked very rough. Unfortunately, it was already day 97, so that village remodel wouldn't be happening during this 100 days after all, especially since I still needed to get one more netherite ingot. So back to the nether it was. Almost got lava again. Would have gotten lava if I'd been closer. Blackstone saved me from getting lobbed. And lastly, I almost got lobbed trying to make another path off of the main room. I could have done more mining on day 98, but I had the four ancient debris necessary for the final ingot. So I made my way to the cabin, threw the debris into the furnace, grabbed the bone meal for dye purposes, Realized the one parrot was still stuck outside from day 36, grabbed the debris from the furnace, and went back to the village. Once I was in the village, I threw the netherrack in the furnaces. Even though there's already over four stacks of nether brick blocks, what else am I gonna do with it? And finally, the last netherite tool to complete the full set of netherite gear. With two days to spare, the goal was achieved. I would have to celebrate, but later. I put some more bricks in the basement, but again, no dripstone since I forgot to put a piece of pointed dripstone below the blocks. Before saying goodbye to this world, I figured I should give Barry a beetroot and also get him out of the cow pen. The regular crop farm seemed like a good place. I think he'll be happy here with all the beetroot he could ever want. Back to preparing for the celebration, I purchased some glowstone from the cleric, 
got a sunflower for orange dye, and got to work on the first firework star, and then the second firework star, so I could make the first batch of fireworks, and then the second batch of fireworks. But again, this would need to wait until later. On day 99, I grabbed some bone meal and the netherite hoe and went to the nether to collect crimson fungi blocks to make this area a bit nicer for the abandoned piglin child. Are you the child's parent? I'll take that as a yes. Added some lights in the ceiling, some baby gates to keep the child from wandering upstairs to the nether portal, or into the mines, and out of the boat now. Okay, the child isn't running from the adult, so maybe that is their guardian? Added some decorations. On day 100, the last day, I made some furniture to spruce up the place. And then the piglins went back into the boat so I could safely remodel the ceiling of the other half of the room. You never know when ceiling lava will make an appearance. Installed more baby gates. Ended up moving this furniture because the location wasn't that great after all. Put a sofa there instead. And now hopefully this is a slightly more comfortable home. I'm pretty sure that adult is safe because the child doesn't seem to be trying to avoid them. Okay, kid, I don't know when I'm going to be back, if I'm going to be back, but you take care of yourself. They seem to like standing on the table. Can't say I blame them, I also like to feel tall. Afterwards, it was back to the cabin for one last goodbye. May as well dump some of this nether stuff in the basement. And finally return you to the inside of the cabin with the rest of your friends. I could have attempted to have the parrot follow me through the cabin, but opening the window temporarily seemed like the easiest solution. Okay, all three of you are safe and secure inside. I never got around to finishing the map wall, but that's fine. Goodbye, cabin. And of course, it's raining on the last day. Bye, cows. Bye, other cows. Bye, horse. Bye, nitwit. Remember to feed the animals while I'm gone. There are now two golems stuck in the village crop farm. I think they're just Barry's bodyguards now. It's still raining, but it's showtime, because there is a nearby desert. So we could still be an eyeshot of the village without the rain. It was a short fireworks show, and I probably should have alternated between the two types of fireworks, but oh well. Afterwards, I did some fishing, but then I realized maybe that wasn't the best way to end the time here. So I returned to the cabin, found a compass, and returned to spawn. Besides, I needed a day 100 image for the thumbnail, right? I guess if this video gets 200 likes, I'll play to 200 days. It probably wouldn't take me another two years to make that video. I mean, what are the odds of that happening twice? Until next time, take care.